I'm going to begin on behalf of all the people who are wondering about these issues with question number one, which is about the natural resources in the various African countries you represent. The question is, how are you, how is your government making sure, ensuring that the profits, the money is being made and generated by the natural resources in your country, that these are being used to build human natural resources or human capacity and to improve the lives of the people in your respective countries? How are you making sure that your natural resources and the profits being made are being used to help the people, improve the lives of the people, advance the costs of the people? Uh, maybe we can start with you, Prime Minister Desale. First of all, I would like to thank you very much for this very pertinent uh, question, uh, which is very important for the African continent. You know, we are so much endowed by, with the natural resource in Africa, but uh, utilizing this natural resource in a you know, transparent and efficient and effective manner is very important for the continent. Of course, if you specifically ask Ethiopians, do you have, uh, are you endowed with a natural resource, and specifically the oil and gas resources? Uh, the answer is, we are not yet. But the issue is, you know, natural resource in Africa has to stop to be a curse, but should be a blessing to our, our, our continent. And we should focus on productive sector, and that, that is the basis for growth in Africa. And I, I would like to com commend all of you in supporting Africa in, uh, uh, in human capability accumulation in Africa, which is, you know, if you see uh, the difference between developed and developing nations is simply uh, the difference uh, between the, these groups in uh, the, the ability to accumulate technological capability to develop the nation. So human capital development should be this, at the center of our, our development agenda, and therefore we should rely on our people rather than on, uh, on the natural resource, but use this natural resource for the benefit of you know, supporting this human capability development in the country, as well as technological development. So I see that this is an important question for the continent and we are working on it. And I think the African Union and as I mentioned, the African uh, mechanism of peer review is also working on good governance issue in this sector and transparency and, and uh, you know, equitable uh, distribution of the, the, uh, the wells we have in Africa. So I think uh, it's uh, very important. Thank you again. Prime Minister Dessalen, uh, if I have the permission, uh, Your Excellency, President Hefike Punye Pohamba of Namibia, same question, how are we ensuring, how is your government, your leadership ensuring that the natural resources of Namibia are being used to build human capacity and improve the lives of the people of Namibia? Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. First, I would like to inform my audience that Namibia got independence 23 years ago. Why I'm saying this, I wanted to state that development in African countries is not the same. You have a countries that got independence in the 60s and those who got independence at the time like my country got it in the 90s. Now, what happened is that the resources in my country 
are plenty. We have a diamond, we have a gold, we have a fish, and we have agriculture. Who owns these resources is a question, and I want to tell you who. These resources have been owned by the formerly advantaged Namibians, those who do not know Namibia. Namibia was under apartheid South Africa. And that the people who have been exploiting the resources of Namibia are the people of the white color. The whites, they are referred to as whites. When we got independence, we could not just go and confiscate the property that had already owned by these people. Yes, some of them are Namibians. Yes, there are some who are not Namibians. The people in Europe, they own the land in our country. And our country is a country um, governed by the rule of law. We could not just go and take the property from those who had the property. So now, you find that uh, most of the resources are still being exploited by those who did exploit them before independence. We export the raw materials to, not into Africa, but overseas. Why? There are many factors. And this is where I want to express our congratulations to the Africa America Institute. Our people have been denied the freedom, even the freedom to education. The first university in Namibia was built or opened two years after our independence. And when you talk about the development of the resources, this has to be done by the people with the skills or the people who are educated. That is something that was denied our people by those who ruled our country. I said most of the resources are still in the hands of those who used to enjoy them before independence. Some of them are outside Africa. You come to Namibia, you find that the vast of land is owned by the people outside Africa. Our constitution says, do not confiscate the property of other people. We keep it to that. Therefore, we are still struggling to get the resources, the means of production, from the hands of those who have been having them and those who are still keeping them. But to get these resources from them, we have to negotiate with them. 
And if they say no, we won't be able to get them. Excellency. I uh, we will come back to you. But briefly, what can you and your government do? Is there anything, or is it just a helpless situation and there is nothing that can no, be done? No, we have started doing something. Okay. We have started doing something. We have established our own companies, the government the company, so to say, and we have started asking those who have so that we can share. And this is what we have started. But it's not enough. We want to do more. It's not enough at all. We, I think we have a long way to go. We have a long way to go up to the point that we will now say, yes, we are now independent, and we are controlling the means of production of the country. As I'm talking to you, it's not the case. Okay. But efforts are being made. Okay. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think she has a microphone. Okay. I hope it's you. Yes. Honorable Member of Parliament and uh, Minister for Foreign Affairs, and I I'd like to add the regional integration part because our big sister, Dr. Nkosazana Dlamini Zuma, is, is trying to make all of us one, so she will be more interested in the regional integration part. Minister Hannah Tete, Ghana has been endowed with a lot of natural resources, gold, diamond, and just in the last few years, uh, petrol and gas. How are the natural resources of Ghana uh, being used to improve the lives of people to develop human capacity. Thank you very much, Ben. And indeed, we have been blessed with mineral resources, and they have helped considerably to fund some of the development that has taken place in our country. But I'd like to start by saying that when we express the question in such general terms, how do your mineral resources help to build your human capacity? it simplifies what actually is quite a complex process. The mineral resources that we have, the commodities that we have, when we, as is the case for most African countries, export them in their almost most basic form, we are at the low end of the value chain. And so it's not just about the mineral resources and being able to extract them. It's to be able to ensure that you are able to create the partnerships, the framework, encourage the investment that does the value addition, that encourages greater beneficiation, that increases tax revenue, that gives the government the capacity to invest in other sectors of the economy, which is key to our economic development and growth. And so from the point of view of Ghana, in order to ensure that these resources have been managed in an effective way, and we have been able to maximize the opportunities from these resources, we've had over the years a number of very important pieces of legislation to ensure that whether it is in the mining of solid minerals, that's typically what we've done with gold, with diamonds, with manganese, with bauxite, or whether now with the new petroleum resources, with the Petroleum Revenue Management Act, we've created a framework that puts in place and quite shows the transparency with which the government is able to obtain some of the revenue because a lot of these investments are indeed by private sector companies and not so much state businesses investing in the minerals and mining sector. And then how we've used that revenue through our budgetary system to invest in our people. And the priorities for the government have been investing in people, investing in the economy, investing in infrastructure, because all of these will combine to create the framework that will encourage a lot more investment in Ghana, that will encourage more capacity building and enhancement, and that will make our country more prosperous. In simple terms, in, as far as we are concerned, the most important function of government is to act on behalf of its people in a manner that is fair and transparent and in conformity with the rule of law. That is what we have been able to do with our democracy. And that is what the institutions that we have created 
under our democratic dispensation have helped us to benefit from. I would be the first to admit. <laughs> I would be the first to admit that there's a lot more to be done because we have a very young population and we have to be able to build their skills and talents so that we don't only benefit from our mineral wealth, but we are able to create a diversity in our economy that is really going to make us prosperous. When you look at a great country like the United States, yes, they had oil, but can you say that the United States was made on oil? Definitely not. The United States is made up of a whole gamut of businesses, productive, extractive, the provision of services, and such diversity that has created the wealth and the systems for which this country is the envy of the world. So we've got to look in broader terms than just our mineral resources. We've got to look at the big picture and create the frame that allows us to be prosperous, not only from our mineral resources. Uh, Minister Bernard Membe, uh, we, you, I'm sure you've got all your answers lined up. Uh, Tanzania has just discovered oil and gas. Uh, Tanzania has been a very, very peaceful country. Tanzania has hosted many liberation movements in the past, even South Africans and many brothers uh, and sisters from the other parts of the continent. Uh, coming back to the same question, what would your response be? Thank you very much. Uh, just as my colleagues have said, Tanzania is one of the countries that is much, much more endowed with the mineral resources. We have gas, as you have said, about 70 trillion cubic feet now, and we hope to get more. Now, we have passed the legislation that calls for corporate social responsibility, and uh, in that, the priority is given to the people around that mining area uh, where those people are supposed to receive the basic infrastructure, education, healthy, training, because we don't like to, to export labor from outside, particularly from those countries that are investing in our country. And so the corporate social responsibility is key to at least ensuring that we engage the people in our area, that we, part, we, we make our people participate in the entire economic growth, and that uh, we reduce to some extent the degree of exploitation if we were to let everybody or any investor to come to Tanzania and then take everything and bring in labor from outside and then you, the exploitation becomes maximum. And so the legislation really takes care of that with the intention of empowering the people. But secondly, we are also in a drive to learn from the best practices of those countries that have already got the, the gas, oil, and other minerals. We have sent our people there. We now have also a drive to send experts outside uh, to learn more so that they own the process at, in the final analysis rather than letting all those mineral deposits be exploited by outsiders. So at the interim, we are allowing the investors to come, but in the long term, we want the Tanzanians to own that process so that the mineral deposits and the profits that come out of it benefit the Tanzanians. I thank you. Honorable Bernard Member Asante Sana, as they say, we, we have had a lot of questions. In fact, uh, the Africa America Institute organized a social media contest for questions. Uh, we have two of the winners, Ronke Olaleye. I don't know if Ronke is here. Can you raise your hand? And we acknowledge Ronke. She is there. Uh, thank you, Ronke. And then we have Bukekile Dube. Bukekile, are you here? Ah, they are on the same table. Uh, because of time, I'm not quite sure we can ask these questions right now, but we want to jump quickly to Africa 50 years from now. Uh, I tell some of my friends, uh, there was a song when I was growing up that said, Joanna, give me hope. Uh, 50 years from now, what is the vision moving ahead? What hope?
can we get from you, excellencies? If you have to paint a picture, if you have to paint a portrait of Ethiopia 50 years from now, the year 2060, Namibia, the year 2060, Ghana, West Africa, maybe Africa would be one united Africa, Africa with the same foreign policy and, and trade policies. M Mr. Member, 50 years from now, if we can begin with you, Prime Minister Desalem, what is the picture that you want to give us of Ethiopia or Africa as a whole 50 years from now, sir? Thank you very much. <clears throat> I think now, uh, out of the 10 fastest growing economies globally, six of them are in Africa. So this shows that the last 10 years, Africans has performed very well. And I think with this gear, and if you continue on with this pace, it's obvious that in the coming 25, 30 years, most of the African countries will come into the middle income. And then in the 50 years, we see that Africa will be one of the advanced countries and nations, I mean continent, and therefore, obviously, it is, it is possible. Whether we have a natural resource or not, if we depend on our own, own people and in the capability of our people, it is possible. Countries like, you know, most of the Asian countries, they do not have the natural wealth endowment as we do have in Africa. That's a plus that can help us, but we shouldn't rely on it, but we should rely on our, our capability, or our people's capability, and in that case, 50 years, Africa will be advanced, prosperous, peaceful, and a place where many diasporas will come back home into Africa. Thank you, Prime Minister Desalen. President Pohamba, please. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I see Africa in the next 50 years becoming a prosperous continent. I say this because when I look at the programs that Africa has set for herself, is that when some years back in Abuja, Nigeria, we decided to establish the Rex. And uh, out of this Rex, or through the Rex, we will be able to develop region by region, of which when they are developed, then we will be able even to declare the continental government of Africa. So I see that uh, within 50 years time, we will move ahead. The most important thing that we have been discussing at the, o, at the AU is also the question of the people in diaspora, that they, some of them, we have them in different continents, the Africans, they should come home and assist the development of the continent. Now starting with the Rex, we start with the Rex until we reach the point whereby we will be able to declare a continental government of Africa where the people will do everything for themselves, not entirely depending on other countries outside the continent as it is the case now. Thank you. Minister for Foreign Affairs of Ghana, Hannah Tete. Can I see all New Yorkers moving to Accra in the next 30 years, please? <laughs> when you look at Ghana today, when you look at Africa today, you can see that we have a continent that is on the move. Now, I know that it's been described as the rising continent. It's been described as 
the continent of the future. And I think that it has the potential to be all of that. Because we have a continent that is young. We have the energy and the vibrancy of youth. We have a continent where our countries are moving slowly, inexorably, and closer to having democracy, properly so-called, established all across our continent. I see a continent where, as a result of technology and innovation, especially in communication and information um, technology, you've got access to new ideas and innovations, and people can see what's happening and learn from what is going on elsewhere. And I see a continent that is going to go closer towards increased urbanization. Because by 2050, in the, by 2050, it's anticipated that over half of our population will live in cities. There are therefore a number of factors that come together, which with the right kind of leadership and administration can ensure that we have a continent that is vibrant and indeed a continent that is the next major source of economic growth. So yes, I do see a prosperous Africa. And yes, I do see a Ghana that is going to be successful. And yes, I do think that Accra is going to be able to challenge New York. <laughs> but more importantly, but more importantly, I think that all of the current developments that we're seeing, some of which I've mentioned already, are going to lead us to a continent where the vision of our independence leaders for an integrated, united Africa will soon emerge. And I also see a continent where, contrary to some of the things that you see on radio, you hear on radio and you watch on TV here in, in the United States, people will see that there is a lot of promise and prosperity in Africa. And I think that they'll be running to us the same way as a lot of people are running to China today, except it will be a nicer place to go. <laughs> Okay, Minister Hannah Tete, we thank you. Honorable Bernard Member, one of the photos I have on my Facebook page is of Julius Nyerere and Kwame Nkrumah uh, towards a united Africa. Uh, how do you see Tanzania by the year 2060, 50 years from now? How do you see Africa? And Tanzania has always taken the trouble of other African continent, uh, countries. How do you see, or what picture can you paint of your country and the whole continent 50 years from now? Uh, three pictures can be painted. <coughs> One, that in the next 50 years, I don't see this trouble of having any constitutional uh, governments existing in Africa. Uh, Africa will be democratic enough, people will be mature enough, and I don't see the unconstitutional changes of government troubling Africa in the next 50 years. Two, Africa will be able to break the poverty cycle. And this poverty cycle will be broken, particularly when we take into account the introduction and the investment in energy, and doctor, as Dr. Kanda has said, uh, energy sector. If we invest in energy, which will enable the rural farmers or the rural people to now transform their commodities instead of selling the raw materials to sell the semi-processed or processed goods to add value that will definitely reduce or break the poverty cycle that is now surrounding Africa. And at a global level, I can see Africa assuming at least a seat in the, in the Security Council. Uh, until today, Africa with 54 countries is not occupying the permanent position in the permanent Security Council of the United Nations. We have cried for this, we are battling for this, and I'm sure this, this battle will be won within 50 years, that Africa must be afforded. <laughs> Africa will be afforded the seat in the Security Council, these reforms will come, and Africa will unite to make sure that we occupy that seat, because 60% of all issues that are being discussed in the UN Security Council involve Africa. And there is no justification whatsoever why in the next 50 years we should not be there. We will. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies, I, I think my job is done on that positive note. I think we've received a lot of food for thought this evening. Uh, things are not as bad and as hopeless as probably some channels would like us to believe we have hope. And so we thank you, Excellency Prime Minister Haile Mariam Desalen of Ethiopia. We thank you, Your Excellency President Hefike Punye Pohamba of Namibia. Honorable Minister for Foreign Affairs and Regional Integration, Hannah Tete Yedawasi. Thank you. And Honorable Minister Bernard Membe of Tanzania, representing President Jakaya Kikwete Asante Sana. Ladies and gentlemen, enjoy the rest of the evening.